Howdy, this here's Paul, and we're fixing to have us another little Sunday school lesson. Uh, today's lesson, uh, the title is uh, Cora's Rebellion, and uh, if you've been a foreign, uh, uh, we're still in numbers today. The text comes out of number 16, 1 through 14, and our related scriptures go, is uh, Deuteronomy 11, 1 through 7, and then Psalms 106. 16 to 18 now if you've been following this is all a continuing story about the or this this quarter I guess excuse me has been about the Israelite children traveling through the desert leaving Egypt and going to the promised land and uh, they struggling I don't mind telling you they struggling and, and they struggled with God, and I don't know why they did. Of course, I don't know why I did for so long. Uh, but uh, just like the lesson, uh, the title of the lesson says Chorus Rebellion, we're going to learn about that this week, and then next week we're going to talk about the, the consequences of Chorus Rebellion. So uh, I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to read the scripture, and then I'm going to try to expound on my note, you know, with my notes just a little bit. Lord God, we thank you. We're ever thankful for the fact that you are the uh, covenant-making, covenant-keeping God and what you say you do. And Lord God, we thank you that you are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Lord God, you are the one and only true God. Heavenly Father, we just pray that as we break your word today that you would open hearts and minds and and uh, a little piece of it would get in somewhere and make people want to know more about you, Lord. Uh, we pray that uh, them that already knows about you, Lord, they get a greater understanding of you. And Lord God, we just thank you for all the, moment, all the many miracles you've been working in our lives and all that you've been working on, all you're going to work on. Lord God, we just praise your holy name. Lord God, we pray for the sick and afflicted because we know you are the great physician. We know there ain't nothing you can't fix. Lord God, we also understand that sometimes that uh, well, we just have to come home to you. Lord God, we thank you and we praise your holy name. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen, amen, and amen. Like I said, this week's lesson is called Korah's Rebellion. And it's uh, just like what the title says. And uh, I'm going to just dive right into the word here. Number 16, 1. Now Korah, the son of Ishar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan, and Abiram, and the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Pel, sons of Reuben, took men. And they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, You take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. And when Moses heard it, he fell upon his face. And he spake unto Korah and unto all his company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will show you who are his and who is holy, and will cause him to come near unto him. Even him whom he hath chosen will he cause to come near unto him. This do. Take your censers, Korah, and all his company, and put fire therein, and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow, and it shall be that the man whom the Lord doth choose, he shall be holy. You take... Wait a minute, where did I get to? Pardon me. You take too much upon you, ye sons of Levi. And Moses said unto Korah, Here I pray ye, ye sons of Levi, seemeth it but a small thing unto you that the Lord of Israel hath separated you from the congregation of Israel 
to bring you near to himself to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them. And he hath brought thee near to him, and all thy brethren, the sons of Levi, with thee, and seek ye the priesthood also? For which cause both thou and all thy company are gathered together against the Lord? And what is there in that ye murmur against him? And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, which said, We will not come up. It is a small thing that thou hast brought us up out of the land that floweth with milk and honey, to kill us in the wilderness, except thou makest thyself altogether a prince over us. Moreover, thou hast not brought us into the land that floweth with milk and honey, or given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Wilt thou put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. That is a word, thank God. Let me get down here to my notes. Now, if you've been following with us, of course, you can start anywhere in the Bible and learn something, but if you've been following with us, the events recorded in numbers have just gotten worse and worse. From com repeated complaints to attacks on God's chosen leaders to rebellion against God and his promises and plan. As a result, God had threatened to annihilate his people and Moses, uh, as we come to number 16, we might think things are finally going to get better. Perhaps Israel has been scared straight. Perhaps God's people will truly pr repent. The narrative in number 16, however, demonstrates no spiritual progress among the people. In fact, Korah's rebellion provides another new low in the history of Israel. It seems that all the discontentment and malicious motives of our earlier lessons in the book of Numbers find some level of culmination in Korah's rebellion. Now we want to delve into a study of the depths of sinful propensity and examine motives and methods. We need to understand that rebellion against God's order is rebellion against the Lord himself. And we need to sharpen our discernment in recognizing and combating the spirit of rebellion against God and his kingdom so that our lives demonstrate the consistent desire to follow and obey God. God said that uh, obedience was better than sacrifice and rebellion was as witchcraft. I don't know where that's at right off the top of my head, but I could find it. The Bible is a book that could never be written solely by mere men. It's, it's too condemning. It's too unflattering and, and too unfiltered. The Bible does not speak to how good man is, and it does not go to great length to show man's potential for doing good. I know when Noah and his wife, his sons and their wives, got off the ark after the great flood. Noah built the altar to sacrifice to God. And one of the first things out of God's mouth was man's heart is corrupt from his youth. The Bible portrays man as inherently sinful and more often than not portrays man's negative potential. Now, number 16 is one of many Bible passages that explores the depravity of man. Here we see men who had crossed an, uh, the miraculously parted Red Sea uh, and then watched the Egyptian army destroyed when the water collapsed on top of them. But now, they're committing treasonous acts as if there would be no consequences. It's like they ain't learned nothing, much like today. Number 16 is a glimpse into sheer, unadulterated rebellion, a full dose of the negative potential found in the hearts of fallen people. Again, the acts of Korah and his co-conspirators demonstrate that many in the camp of Israel 
still did not support Moses and Aaron. Dissension abounds. Indeed, there were those who supported only themselves and their own agendas, despite what God had done through Moses and Aaron in the past, it's like they hadn't even been watching. I think the last sentence, the last uh, the last verse let me get to it. Nope. That's in the next lesson. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, here's now. Korah's rebellion happened in the way that many rebellions have historically occurred through the wicked confluence of selfish ambition and blatant disregard for proper authority. Is it ringing any bells about what's going on now? It is amazing how just a few bad people can become such a big problem. If you go back to verse 1, it begins by indicating that Korah, along with Dathan, Abiram, and On, On was the guy's name, conspired together to lead some 250 other Israelite leaders. It called them princes in a hostile attempt to gain positions of authority for themselves and perhaps displace Moses and Aaron altogether. Now, while the precise, excuse me, precise motive for the rebellion is not exposed here, the passage initially indicates that Korah and his men argued that Moses and Aaron had selfishly consolidated their power for their own benefit. Korah said, Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves? above the congregation of the Lord. You have to understand, God set this thing up and told Moses what to do and told Aaron what to do. He told, he outlined everything and everybody's job in the whole nation of Israel. He told them what they was going to do. Well, they was unhappy with, with the leadership, so now they're going to try to throw out what they got and take over. I doubt seriously whether Korah had any of the community in mind, and, and, and moreover, he had in mind he was going to take over and he was going to be chief. It's a common complaint. Too many chiefs and not enough Indians. Now, in response, Moses promised that the next day the Lord himself would show everyone who his true servants were. He told the rebels to appear before the Lord the next day with censers in hand. As a Levite, Korah already held a privileged position, but he apparently sought the priesthood as well. See, they was responsible for the tabernacle, setting it up and taking it down, carrying it. Moses intimated that Korah and his men thirsted for power when he stated, Seemeth it but a small thing unto, the, unto you that the God of Israel had separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them? See, they was less inclined to take care of the folks than they was themselves. Now as the dialogue continues, you, you, you gain more knowledge about what's going on. Dathan and Abiram refused to come to Moses as he beckoned them. They reason it is a small thing that thou hast brought us up out of the land that floweth with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness except thou make thyself altogether a prince over us. See, they accusing him of bringing them away from what they was a going toward. 
They thought that Egypt was the land flowing with milk and honey. It didn't matter that they was oppressed by their masters, making them make bricks out of mortar or out of mud and straw. You know, just go back and read about the the ten plagues and and and, and leading up to the ten plagues. Here these insurgents are claiming that Moses' leadership was inept and that he could not bring the children of Israel to the promised land, that Moses wished ill upon his people and Moses glorified in his own power over the people. If you go back just a few chapters, Moses sent 12 spies out and 10 of them come back and said, oh, they's milk, they's, they sure enough the land of milk and honey, but they're giants over there. Caleb said, I don't mind. God fights for us. All we got to do is go where God's going to give it to us. But no. More rebellion. Korah and those who joined him had decided they should take matters into their own hands. They were misled by their own desires and they sought to mislead those around them. Just look what's going on around now. Blind leading the blind. Ain't nobody paying attention to what God says. They failed to grasp that rebellion against Moses and Aaron was rebellion, rebellion against God who personally had appointed them to the positions of authority. Moses didn't just jump up and say, I'm going to lead y'all. Get out of the way. He didn't say, get out of the way, I'm going to lead y'all. He said, God said, I'm going to send you down there. I want you to do this job for me. He didn't take nothing upon himself. In one of the lessons, past lessons, it talked about how humble Moses was. The actions of Korah and others in number 16 in rejecting God's chosen leaders for the nation illustrate the truth that those who exalt themselves find it easy to despise and denigrate those who have been exalted by God. Now Korah and other rebels had convinced themselves and now wished to convince the rest of Israel. See, they, they, they you know, they're going around, uh, they, they doing just what they're doing up there in Washington right now. They're going around seeing who they can draw to their side of the fight. They was trying to convince the rest of Israel that they deserved the position of authority equal to those of Moses and Aaron. Too many chiefs, not enough Indians. Korah and his company thought they could do a better job than Moses and Aaron. They even believed that usurping the roles of Moses and Aaron would be an act of justice and liberation for the people of God. It just goes to show that if you tell a lie often enough, there's going to be some people believing, even if you're telling it to yourself. These men serve as a bright, uh, excuse me. These men serve as a prime example of how sin can warp and manipulate one's thoughts and feelings and put them in direct opposition to God's clearly stated will. But I want to tell you something. God is gracious and forgiving. And even though there's consequences for your actions, all you got to do is get on your knees. All you got to do is confess your sins. I sin every day. I try not to. But I catch myself doing it. I have to ask for forgiveness. I have to repent. Like Paul said, I have to die daily. I have to kill off the human part of me and take on the spiritual part of God. There ain't no other way. You can walk yourself right into hell if you let you, if you let yourself. But it ain't God's desire that anybody should wind up in hell. I just pray that this finds good ground somewhere and you find find reason to reflect on yourself. This lesson teaches me more teaching it seems like than maybe the people I'm a teaching. But it does cause me 
to give pause and reason to reflect on my own actions and stuff. Lord God, we pray today that in the sound of my voice, somebody has heard your word and took it to heart. I pray today, Lord God, that the fields are, uh, are, are plenty and, Lord God, that the seed is good. We pray, Lord God, that they will nurture it and let it grow in their heart, Lord. And we just pray that more people come to salvation. That's our, that's our whole job here is to lead people to salvation. We have to lead by example, though. We thank you, Lord God, that you are who you say you are, that you are gracious and merciful and loving. Father, uh, if we could just understand that all they got to do is crawl up in your lap and just talk to you like they would talk to their daddy. Lord God, thank you. We praise your holy name. We pray for the sick and afflicted, Lord God. We pray for all the misguided folks around, Lord, that they would be saved and baptized in the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen.